right. Well, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and kind of start the ball rolling on um, hearing from uh, Dr. Manzone. But my name is Nicole Endicott. I am a program manager here at IEA. And uh, we also have Lori Mittermiller on the webinar. She's a program coordinator for our academy program um, and some of our other initiatives here at IEA. So we are here to moderate and help out, um, but it should all be smooth sailing and we're all in great hands with, <laughs> with Jessica. Um, if you're new to IEA, the work that the Institute for Educational Advancement does, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that supports gifted youth nationwide. So we have enrichment classes here in Pasadena. We have online learning opportunities. We have a summer camp program. Uh, we have a merit-based scholarship program for high school. And then on top of all of that, we have public policy initiatives, educational consulting, and speaker events like this one. Uh, so tonight we are lucky enough to hear from Dr. Jess Jessica Manzone on the topic of curated conversations with gifted learners. Uh, I'll introduce Dr. Manzone in just a moment, but I did wanna make sure everyone kind of sees, has the lay of the land here. We have uh, a chat feature and that will be used throughout this talk to, to get feedback from you all on uh, what Dr. Manzone is sharing. So feel free to use that chat and make sure it's on uh, chatting to everyone. We'll be doing some public chat. Uh, there will also be some time for Q&A at the end, um, as well as kind of throughout the talk, but uh, you can use either the chat or the Q&A feature uh, for that. So there's chat or Q&A, uh, either way you'll get your question read by one of us and uh, we'll do our best to get you an answer. Uh, we are recording this, as you saw when you joined, so it's best to not share any personal information in your in your questions, but um, we would kind of edit that out regardless. But it just makes our job a little easier if you're not giving specifics about um, your child or any questions that you have. All right. Uh, Dr. Jessica Manzone is an assistant professor of practice in the College of Education at Northern Arizona University. She was a classroom teacher and instructional coach before entering higher education. Jessica currently serves as lead faculty for the Arizona Teacher Residency, where she works to prepare graduate students for future careers serving their local communities. Jessica's research interests include curriculum and instruction for diverse, gifted, and talented, and gifted and advanced students. Uh, she speaks at state, national, and international conferences on gifted education and provides demonstration lessons for school districts related to curriculum and instruction. All right, um, so we're going to hear from Dr. Jessica Manzone, and again, any questions in the chat, and we will um, help you out, but thank you so much for coming. Nicole, thank you for that. Uh, one comment, um, we got something in the Q&A that said that the chat is disabled for participants. So I told them to hold tight thank and you. We'll, we'll work on that. So thank you I for bringing I just that checked that here. on. So you should be set now. That's yeah. Can somebody I, do a test? Oh, perfect. Thank you perfect. so much for that. Thank you. Yeah, there's two steps. You have to enable it. <laughs> and I missed the second one, but thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we will go ahead and get started. The materials I'm happy to make available to anyone. I'll send them to Nicole after we're finished. You can have them. Let me share my screen and then we can. Is that working? Can, can everyone see that correctly? Perfect. So thank you for the introduction from both Nicole and Laurie. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm happy to be here. These are the hats that I wear on a regular basis. And this is kind of the framework or the paradigm by which I'm approaching tonight's conversation. First and foremost, I'm a classroom teacher. I've been in education 21 years most uh, a good chunk of that time in higher ed, but I started as a classroom teacher. I then moved to an instructional coach working specifically with new teachers and um, cl current classroom teachers in curriculum and instruction, some for gifted learners, some just curriculum and instruction for all kids. And I currently work at Northern Arizona University. I'm an assistant professor of practice where I am working with a group of 22 new teachers. We call them teacher residents. You see my teachers were up on the Navajo reservation doing some place-based curriculum. And I'm also a parent. 
to, um, to two kids, but one, a parent to a two-e neurodiverse child. He's the bigger one in the like Elton John style get up there. His name is Dominic and he is in kindergarten out here in Arizona. He has both a dual diagnosis as a highly gifted learner and uh, he is autistic. So I'm approaching this from a parent perspective as well. And I know all of you are wearing many hats. So what I'd like to do, just like I start all of my classes with, with anybody, is let's just like take a moment and kind of have a little fun here. I don't think we say that word enough in education. The technical term for that would be an engagement. And we should be doing that for all kids, gifted kids, not identified gifted kids. So in the chat, I'd like you to type the food that you most dislike. A lot of times we think, oh, what food do I really, really like? But for my little chewy kid, it's the foods we don't like that are most interesting. Like he won't even sit at the same table as anyone eating broccoli or anything green, to be quite honest. So type in the chat, if you will, a food that you dislike the most. And what I'd also like you to do is look at the patterns. Do we see any patterns that are emerging in this data set? And yes, I would use those that language with my learners, my any grade level, like we're collecting data here, students and scholars, as we think about the foods that we dislike. And as you see other people's food go up, do we see any patterns here? Ooh, cilantro, that's green. That's a green food. Hmm. Yeah, Emma, I have foods that are not, that I like, but they're not my friends, right? And that's an interesting distinction. Yeah, Debbie, my kids are like mac and cheese snobs. They will only eat craft, which I'm like, oh my gosh, real mac and cheese, come on guys, and they won't eat it. Craft, it's, if it's not out of the craft box, they don't want it. Oh, black licorice, yeah, I'm not a fan of licorice either. Mm. John, I can honestly say I've never had an elk cart. I, I'm gonna have to try that. Oh, um, Laura, one of the reasons you wouldn't be able to see everyone's comment is some people are typing it just to the panelists and then some, some people are typing it to everyone. So if you want everyone to be able to see, got it, thank you. But you do raise a really good point. And one of the things that I've been trying to, to talk about is changing the narrative about what it means to be a participant in any space. So we'll call it participation opt-ins, right? And I think we should be doing this with kids in a classroom too, that we should be, a lot of times, we look at silence as negative, but someone can be actively thinking or actively listening without their hand being raised. Like my son, and think about this if you're if this is your child too, my son could be participating fully, but his back's gonna always be to you. And he might be doodling or tinkering with something to the side, but if the teacher calls his name, he can answer every question. But we don't tend to value that in school or, or we, teachers get caught with if we're not looking directly at the teacher or their hands not raised or that but that doesn't mean that they're not participating so in this space you can participate in a lot of different ways you can actively think um, in your own head as you're going through this you could be maybe making dinner while you're listening or turning and talking to your partner or to your child that might be sitting with you you could type something into the open chat that would be to everyone to contribute openly, or you can type something to panelists and that would just go to Nicole, Laurie and I, and we could read it out loud or it could just be for us. Or you can type it in the Q&A and that can be read anonymously. So there's all of these participation opt-ins. You go with what you feel and where you are at the moment. And I do apologize. It's um, Webinars are hard for me in the sense, one, I have ADHD and I get a little scattered. Two, I like to see people and it's hard when I can't see people. So somebody in the chat, like, stop me. I was born and raised in East Baltimore. I'm an East Coast Italian American. I tend to talk fast. I talk with my hands. If I lapse into what I'll call Baltimore drawl and you haven't understood a thing that I've said, somebody please post something in the chat. Can we go back to that, Jess? Um, I do go by Jess. My pronouns are she and her. I'm sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. Um, so let's, let's jump right, right in. 
Uh, I don't think you can listen with cameras. Yeah, I don't think we have cameras on options here. I think it's just in webinar format. Yeah, Ashley, I, I absolutely agree with you. And that's where I think we really need to work with teachers in schools to be purposeful that that silence can be equally as valued because we're being a listener and we all demonstrate and display knowledge in lots of different ways. That's a culturally sustaining approach, especially for gifted education that we need to be talking about more. Ooh, another Baltimorean, awesome. Okay. So you'll have this slide, but I just wanted to put up some of the general characteristics of gifted learners. Like, as we know, in some times, in some kids, under some conditions, right? And that these are some of the things that we're working towards in our curriculum and that we can start to be as parents, that we can start to be doing at home. When we see these in our kids, how can we start to capitalize on them and to nurture them? And that's what we're looking at and what I'm going to call cultivating a habit of mind, right? I, I currently live in Phoenix, Arizona in the Grand Canyon State. And so when we think about a habit of mind, it's like the water cutting the path, carving that path through the Grand Canyon. And it's done that so many times in that way that it just becomes natural. That's like a habit of mind for our thinking, that when we engage in a practice to such a degree that we know it, that we internalize it, that it becomes ours, it just becomes a way of thinking that we engage in, then it becomes a thinking habit of mind. And so what I'm gonna talk about tonight are just five things, five activities or opportunities that you could do at home that start to carve that water for your student, for your child, for how they start to think. And not necessarily, not think in school, but just think in general. And we're looking at it as falling under the umbrella or under the auspices of a talent forward or a talent focused approach. That it means that we're actively looking for ways that kids are demonstrating or telling us what their interests, their aptitudes, their passions are. And then when we see that, we go, oh, how can I replicate that? That's what we should be doing in schools. I truly believe that we would be identifying more gifted kids if we looked at a talent focused approach for all kids. All kids have the right to come to school to find something interesting, to develop a talent, to nurture a passion. And it's that idea of repeated engagement. So tonight, I'm going to be looking at things that, from a curriculum standpoint, I've done with students in schools. And then during the pandemic, when I was getting a lot of calls from parents, what can I do with my child? They're blowing through all of their online work in 20 minutes. How can we do some things at home? I started to come up with this. And, and I appreciate feedback thoughts, comments of how I could make this better and develop it, how you could use it with your, your own child at home. And that's the focus I'm going for, is that what can we do on a regular basis that get, gives kids a chance to think and to talk, not an hour of homework that's written down, that's only focused on one knowledge domain, but a way to explore and think about the world that just becomes their paradigm for when they go out. I truly believe I, I'm, I might date myself here, you know, the 1997 Kevin Costner movie, if you build it, they will come, right? If we build opportunities, both in the classroom you know, if I'm talking with my teacher hat, if we openly and actively build opportunities in the classroom for kids to demonstrate their pal passions, talents, and interests, they will, right? They will. We know this as parents at home because that's, that's what we do at home, but we don't see it all the time transferred in schools. So I'm going to focus on what can we do at home where your kids are already engaged in demonstrating their talents, aptitudes, and passions. I think we should be doing more of this in the classroom. So I'll, if your kids are in school in California, they're probably using the prompts of depth and complexity. If they're in New Jersey, they're using the prompts of depth and complexity. If they're not, it doesn't matter. All I want you to think about is that I'm going to show you some keywords 
prompts. I'll send them to Nicole and Laurie and you can, I'll have a resource packet for you. The prompts are just cues. Think about like a building manager, right? That walks around our building manager in our office has this huge key ring and he probably has like 20 or 30 keys on it. And each key unlocks a different door. If we think about in our head, the way we think and learn, we can prompt our thinking. And when we unlock different avenues of exploration, it's not to doors in a building, but it's to avenues in the content that I could talk about something very differently by looking at its details versus looking at the ethical issues inherent in the same issue. Then looking at the different perspectives that that issue or that someone looking at that issue might hold. All it is, is the prompts give students access points to talk about what they like in any topic. So my teacher might be giving me a must read novel and I might not be particularly interested in that novel, but I can learn to pick my own key off that key ring and unlock parts of that novel that are of interest to me. It gives me an opportunity to share what I know. I may not be able to do X that my teacher is asking me, but I can really talk about the ethical issues. So there's an avenue for me to engage. We're talking about engagement here. And it would, it would sound like this, okay? So again, don't write any of this down. I will send it to you, you will have it. These are things that we can do at home with our kids that feel fun and interesting, but underneath that surface, you're working to solidify the way they think in an open-ended, fluid and flexible fashion, meaning you're pushing something that has more than right, more than one right answer. And I'm going to even take the word answer out and say more than one justifiable response, right? Because a one right answer is good for some places and sometimes, but it's definitive and it doesn't leave a lot of room for conversation. But when I change my vernacular to say there are times when there may not be a right answer, there's simply a justifiable rationale. You're explaining why you arrived at that conclusion. You're articulating your rationale for why. It's a, it pushes a very different knowledge domain and very different path of thinking. We're also looking at giving kids opportunities to show what they know and can do with fluidity and flexibility. It means, can they exist in the ambiguity? Can they exist when things are not as definitive? Can they come up with multiple answers and, and just in that kind of group brainstorm or individual brainstorm and think about all the different ways that something can be examined? That's how we're going to get those habits of mind, their characteristics of high creative individuals. But we can provide all learners a chance to carve that pathway with that water, think the Grand Canyon. The more we continue to do it, the more comfortable they will be and the easier it will come for them. And it feels fun and interesting. And it gives you an opportunity to hear what they're saying and to be stimulated by something that they're saying that also engages your talent and interest and passion. Okay. So there are five of them and I'll go through all five, but I'll pause after each one. And I know we can't see each other. So like, I can't see heads nodding or, oh, I don't know what she's talking about. So please, I'll stop after each one. And I want you to type into the chat one or two words that is resonating with you. Or if you have a question about it, Jess, can you give me another example? How would you use this with this grade level? All of that. Okay, and then we'll keep going. And I, I will be cognizant of time because time management is my Achilles heel. Okay, so number one is I'm calling it a headline grab. Okay, and this came about, uh, my kids are five and three and we had gone to a hotel and it was one of those hotels where they were still putting newspapers, like real newspapers out in front of the door in the mornings. And my kids throw open the door to head down to breakfast and they see this newspaper. And my son goes, what is this? 
And I had a moment of sheer embarrassment as a parent and went, oh my God, he doesn't know what a newspaper is, you know? And I said, it's a newspaper. And I said, it, it tells you about what's going on in the world. And this is a local newspaper. So it's going to tell you about what's going on in the local community. Let's bring it in. Let's look at it. So he brings it into the hotel room and I turn around and the first thing he's doing is he's, is he's smelling it. Like, do you remember what a newspaper smells like? He was just fascinated by the way it smelled. And like, he ran his fingers over it, trying to, you know, see it rub off on his finger because he'd only ever seen his news digitally, like on a smartphone, electronically, because that's how we do that in our house. But he was so fascinated by this that I'm like, okay, there's something here. I, I need to do more with this. So what we started to do was we just perused the newspaper and we spread it all out, the, all the different sections of the newspaper. And we talked about each section of the newspaper and that the headlines gave you a snapshot as to what was the article was or image was going to be about. So we opened the newspaper and I just, and, and he's five and he can read, but I just let him choose a headline that he liked for whatever reason. And I asked him and he would point to one. I said, Dominic, what were the details in that headline that caught your attention? What said another way, what made you pick that headline? And he, the first one was very interesting. He said he liked the font, the shape of the font. I hadn't even noticed the font, really. I mean, I'd seen it, but I'd not really noticed it. And he's like, I really like the way those letters are shaped. Oh, we call that a font. And it's like when we type, you know, he sees me do my slides for class and yeah, we can change the font. He's very into that. So you just ask kids of any age, what details in the headline caught your attention? And maybe it was a cool and interesting word that they don't know, or maybe they do know it and they like it. It doesn't matter what they say. That's really the point in all of these. It doesn't matter what they say. You're prompting the question to hear the response that gets them thinking, huh, oh, what are the details and what details are drawing my attention into something? Again, that's one of those thinking pathways that I'm cued in to the details. And that not all details are given the same relevance or importance in all contexts and places and why. And that's interesting. Then you could read the article or look at this was a picture, an image that we were looking at. And it was talking about um, this article. We were down in Tucson and it was talking about uh, restaurant week. And we were saying, OK, like, how did this article make you feel? Oh, I'd like to go to that restaurant, mom. Like, I wonder what kind of food they serve there. Do we have a restaurant like that in Phoenix that serves similar food? And he's just asking these questions. And again, that follow-up question, would everyone reading this article feel the same way, is a more sophisticated question set that you could ask, especially if you're reading something that might be more political than Newsweek or that might have more substance to it than, than Restaurant Week. But would everyone reading this article about this restaurant, feel the same way. Dominic, you were excited to go, but would everyone be excited to go? Oh no, why or why not? And then that last one is really interesting. What follow-up questions would you have if we could go and interview the person, the food critic that wrote this article? What might we ask them? What would you want to know as you're reading this? And I gave you some of his follow-up questions. And this is just a quick set of questions. You don't have to ask these exact ones, but it's the idea of like, we've got our smartphones with us all the time. And, you know, we do bedtime story in our house and in our house and that's fine. But sometimes we'll do news story before bed and we'll open either a, a newspaper that I've picked up from the store, or we'll look at at the news on our phone. And again, you know, developmentally what's appropriate for your child and what you do in your home is up to you. But it's like, we're just talking about information that's out in the world. And we're cueing ourselves to think about it through the lens, if you wanna think about them as lenses, through the lens of what details are resonating with me? How did it make me feel? How might it make others feel? Why don't we all feel the same way, reading the same thing, seeing the same thing? And 
what questions do I have? Because so many times in schools, questions go one way. They go from the teacher to the student and we go, oh, good job, right answer, and we move on. This is not about what questions I as the adult have, although I could share mine with my child or my learners in my classroom, but it's what do you want to know? And all questions are valid. What do you want to know? So let me pause and stop here. Oh, hang on. I've lost my chat totally. Um, ah, hold on. Sorry, lost the chat, can't find it. Um, let me pause here for a second. Thoughts, comments about this one. In the chat, if you, if you would like to opt into this participation um, style, type one or two words or, or like just free association. What are things coming to your mind as you're listening to this one? How do you think you could use this with your own child? Yes, it, it is. It is. And it's really valuing that idea that that open endedness, that those divergent responses have value. Sometimes they don't. We, we don't think that they have value in the classroom because that's not what school measures all the time. But you're right that they do have value. And we're showing that they have value by openly and actively soliciting it and encouraging it. Yes, the idea of cognitive interest, absolutely. That we are stimulated constantly and that we can just like, we are in control of those keys and we can open the door to all these other interests and things that surprise us and tantalize us at will. And that's the self-regulation piece that we can self-stimulate intellectually. Even if the task that's being provided to me at school not one that's interested to me. I don't care for that short story. I don't care for that math problem. But is there a way that I can find an avenue into it or from it that is? Yeah, Juan, that's a beautiful point. And, and absolutely an intended consequence. And that's that, that, that SEL, that social emotional piece. When we add the T to SEL, TSEL, transformative social emotional learning. It's doing social emo, it's learning and building social emotional competencies from a justice oriented lens that directly builds and looks at empathy, compassion, identity, diversity, challenging systems of oppression. Great point. Yeah, Todd, beautiful idea. Writing creative activities, absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Yes, John, I, I agree. And when Dominic first started school, it was, it was, you know, he spent so much of the day trying to hold it together at school that he didn't want to talk about his day. So I stopped asking him particularly about the day and I would just do some of this. Hey, Dom, I brought a newspaper in the car today. Let's talk about that. And his whole demeanor change because he didn't want to rehash some of his day. So I, I love you, John, it was so well said the way that you said it, like it just resets a conversation. And I think that's beautiful. All right, let's, let's keep going. Oh, hang, hang on. I'm going. You can't see my screen. Hold on. Um, can everybody see this? Oh, I can't see you. I can't. I'm like thumbs up. Oh, I can't see anybody. Okay. Thank you in the chat. Yes. Okay. This next one um, came from my kids, our little road warriors, because I still do a lot of consulting work in Los Angeles, but I live in Phoenix. So we would drive the six hours from Phoenix into Los Angeles, into Culver City, where their godmother lives. And we'd see a lot of billboards. And it's interesting, the billboard shift from Arizona to California. Okay, do with that comment what you will. But the idea that if we're in the car, anywhere, going anywhere with our kids, and if you're traveling by air, think you uh, kind of put billboards in air quotes, and as you're walking the airport and you're seeing all the advertisements or placards, use that, okay? And again, this is something that can be done in the car. You don't need to belabor it. You don't need to write anything down. You don't even need anything. You're just looking for what you see, that it's a really great point of conversation. So you can see some of these questions are 
geared up for, for some older kids. I wasn't sure what the audience was going to be like, but I'll show you how I translate them down with my five and three-year-old. And we're, we're driving and we see a billboard. And I asked them, what do they think? What do you think that billboard is trying to say? Now, my three-year-old can't read, only knows the letter R and it's the first letter in his name, right? Doesn't know any other letters. So what are these, what do you think that billboard is trying to say? But even he can just intuitively go, oh, that billboard feels positive or they want me to, and he, surely he knows if it's a McDonald's one or he can, you know, read the print around, like if it's trying to sell him something to eat or if it's trying to get him to purchase a new thing or um, that he can kind of answer that. And again, there's no right answer. It's just building an awareness that messages are all around us, that we are inundated by messages in our world. And can we discern what they mean? What are they trying to tell us? How is it being communicated? What is the form of communication? What words did they use? What colors did they use? And that's a really fun one. And incidentally, if you like to travel to art museums, you can ask this same question, right? Have you ever gone to an art museum or gone to the Getty or something and looked at a painting? Ask your kid if the painting was painted in a different color, would it still have the same meaning? What do you think it means now? What do you think the author or the artist is trying to tell us about that painting? How does that painting make you feel? And if that painting was painted in a different color, would it change how it made you feel? Again, no right answer, but the responses really are interesting. And as you're posing the questions to your children or to, if you're a teacher, to your students, think about it for yourself. What do I think the author is trying to tell me? with that billboard. And if they would have used a different font or if they would have put it in a different color, would I be more apt to purchase it? Why or why not? Does that billboard offend me? Why or why not? That last question, I actually, I wish I could take credit for it. I cannot. It came from one of my fourth grade students, a local Phoenix Unified District. We were talking about advertisements and they asked this question, why would a billboard vary based on location? Because they were driving around Phoenix and billboards were showing different a certain piece of information. And then you leave Phoenix and you drive to other parts of Arizona where it gets a little bit more rural, not as urban, different kind of billboards promoting different kinds of things. So it's a very astute question from a fourth grader. Like, and that follow-up question, is that ethical? Is that right? Again, the answer is not as important at times as the asking of the question and the thinking, the pausing and the thinking about it. That have I ever really stopped to look at the billboard? And that billboard is advertising something that I'm not sure should be advertised right next to that school. And why is that okay? Is that okay? It's giving kids a chance to, again, really dig in to what they're seeing in their world. And we as parents and teachers can use that, can capitalize on that, something that they might find interesting and engaging. When I was doing this with my fourth graders, we created our own billboards to highlight something, an issue that we were talking about in the school. And they met with real graphic designers and they met with real city planners to see where billboards could be placed. They asked their questions and then they designed, I mean, on a poster board, obviously, they designed one and they thought about not only what the message was going to be, but what colors were going to be used and what images were going to be used and how big it was going to be and where it was going to be placed and what time of year and when it was gonna run. And when I was working with their fourth grade teacher, 
she said she had done a version of like a poster in the past but thinking about it this way brought up so many more deep conversations because it was only half about the content that they were publicizing and the other half about how they were thinking about messaging in general and that's everywhere and developing those skills to critique and to question is what we were after. All right, again, let me let me stop here in the chat and I'm gonna move a little quickly because I'm looking at time going, oh my God. Um, thoughts, comments about this one. Ways that you could see yourself using this. Other questions that you might wanna pose if you're thinking now about Oh, we do pass a lot of billboards. Like we have a long ride in Los Angeles stuck in traffic. We see a lot of things. And let's look at different neighborhoods and see the different billboards. Yeah, Ashley, that's interesting. I, I have a colleague teaches high school English down in the South Bay and was doing a whole thing on misinformation versus disinformation and fake news using the novel, The Crucible. Brilliant absolutely brilliant pulling these things in yeah good Juan that's a great point that we're highlighting that products in school tend to be written they just do right and if writing is your strong suit wonderful but if it's not my, my child has severe OT issues and he can't I couldn't write at all at the beginning of the school year. And so if things are visual, if he's allowed to demonstrate knowledge in a way other than just something that is written, much better. Mm, Emily, that's great. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Yes, mute the audio. What would your dialogue be? Can you write something over top of it? I love that. Can we tell what's going on just by watching cues or backgrounds? It's a brilliant idea. I'm actually writing it down. Love it. Yeah, Todd, that's a great idea. Great idea. Have you ever, and this could be an interesting um, piggyback to something that Todd's, that Todd's bringing up. Like, what if we took the same company and looked at something that they were advertising like on social media or a digital advertisement versus a print advertisement. Why, what changes when the medium changes? We could conduct a little survey to see how people like to get information. Yeah, good, Ashley, demographics would be interesting. Another thing that, it wasn't intended to come from this, but it, I'm um, back to, I can't remember who said it in the chat, back to somebody's point about building empathy and like talking about things going on in our world. We had gone to a grocery store uh, in our neighborhood and we were looking at some of the advertisements in the grocery store as, you know, we just pushed the cart and my kid was losing his mind and I'm trying to like, you know, find something and, oh, let's look at the advertisements. Let's, let's look at where things are placed in the grocery store. So we're looking, right. And we're looking at what they sell and fruits and all kinds of things. And then we were traveling and we were in a different part of, of our state and we were in a grocery store. And my son noticed that there wasn't the same access to fresh fruit and they don't, where's this stand, mommy? Why don't I see this? They have it in our store. And it was a great way to talk about talk about food deserts and talk about equity issues and like you don't have to do that but that's where these conversations can meander and that's where when we're getting kids to think with these habits of mind and think about these prompts on a regular basis it will become their paradigm for thinking and learning when i was working i worked at usc uh, University of Southern California for almost 11 years with Dr. Sandra Kaplan, the creator of these prompts of depth and complexity. And we were doing them starting in preschool with kids that were four, and they were using them in their preschool class, and they were using them in every grade level up through the sixth grade in one in a particular school site in Los Angeles. And 
when you went in and you listened to kids just have conversations with these prompts, it just became the way that they thought, not the way they thought in school or the way they thought in math class, but just the way that they saw the world. Okay, are we ready to move on to the next one? Okay. This one I'm calling Restaurant Wars. One, because I'm a huge fan of Top Chef and they have a competition in that series and it's Restaurant Wars. And two, because I need to do something when I take my kids out to dinner because it would not be pleasant, right? If I didn't. So I was thinking I was working on a unit with my middle schoolers and we were, one of the standards we were trying to meet was like central theme, right? A big standard central theme of the text and all that. And so I had that in my mind as we were going out to dinner one night. And I realized as we walked up to this restaurant that the concept of a restaurant is like the theme or the central theme of a text, right? It provides the context. It's like the underlying thread that's there. And it's highlighted by the decor and the food and the overall sense of ambiance. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to be doing something with this, right? Because my middle schoolers weren't so interested in the idea of central theme, right? Like it's boring, but they love going out to eat. And so I'm like, we have, and my cousin's a professional chef in New York. So I said, I, I zoomed her in and I said, okay, talk to them about restaurant development and that like people that are creating new restaurants start with a concept. Oh, that's a theme. And that what they weave in purposefully evidences that theme. And like my kids loved it. My middle schoolers loved it. So what I started to do with my kids is when we're out to eat, we try to uncover or unpack the theme of that restaurant right? So we think about the big idea or the major theme in one word. And we do it as soon as we walk in, we look around. Sometimes my kids will run their hands like, ugh, which is, you know, some, they'll run their hands along like the wall if there's a cool texture. But we think about the theme of the restaurant in one word. Oh, is it avant-garde? Is it adventurous? And again, it's a great place to also build vocabulary, but just listen to what they say. And there's no wrong answer. If they say a word that you're like, I don't get that vibe at all, then say that. Really? Dominic, that's interesting. This restaurant kind of feels funky to me. Funky is like eclectic and different. And he's like, he's like, no, I don't like it. What he said was it's noisy. And he didn't mean in terms of sound. He meant because there was a lot of like tchotchkes on the wall. Does that word translate from the East Coast? Like there's a lot of like things on the wall, pictures and random objects and things. I thought it felt funky and interesting. He thought it was noisy. And so it was like two very different points of view. No one right, no one wrong. It's just what it is. So we think about those words. Okay. Then we go in and we look at like, we looking again for the details. What's the seating like? Are, is it benches? Are they comfy booths? Does it look like it's like family style tables where you sit with other people you don't know, which is hard for my kid to do. He doesn't like that. So like if there's family seating, we're out, right? It's that's, that's a big stumbling block. What's the lighting like in this restaurant? We ask questions like if we came back at a different point of day, would the lighting be different? Did they turn it down because it's at night? What's the ambiance? Feel like the ambiance just gives you like an overall sense of enjoyment here. What's it like? And do we think all of those things? Oh, we also look at like, what plates do they serve us on? We were at a barbecue restaurant once that served it on like a, a, like a lunch tray. Oh, they thought that was smashing, just smashing, right? Like, look, we get our food in a lunch tray and isn't this super cool and they love when we go to like places where they're giving out mason jars or something with your ice cream, like all of those details are purposeful. That's just what an author does when they write a story or when like a newspaper article, they're purposefully done. Those words are not random. The content isn't done randomly, it's done purposefully. Then what we do while we wait is we, we look at the menu, 
after we've ordered. And we think about what other foods could we design a new food item that would complement their menu item. So again, this is a high creative task. And we've got, when I was doing this with my sixth graders, we had kids, again, oh, this was over the pandemic. So they actually, some of them were wonderful cooks, chefs. They cooked something at home and they shared it. And it was like a really great way that they were actually applying, like, what would this theme look like? They were making food that they wanted to talk about. Again, think talent development. I didn't know they could cook. And that's on me. If I don't know a kid could do something, it's because I'm not asking the right task questions, right? As a teacher, we should be asking questions that give kids a chance to demonstrate knowledge and interests and passions in lots of different ways. So I can't cook anything. I've actually been asked not to, but my, I come from a family of professional chefs and my kids like to think about menu items and we like to, what would happen if we mixed that with that? Do you think it would taste good? Why or why not? So you can take this in any direction that you like, but again, we're using the world that we live in and the things that we're gonna do anyway. We're, we might go out to eat anyway. Can we use that experience to pose interesting questions to our kids? And then can we, if we're teachers, can we find ways to make the content that we have to teach, that novel that I was going to read, that theme of conflict, that literary element I was going to talk about anyway, can I show it through a restaurant concept? If this book was to be made into a restaurant, what would it be? And how did this book, how has this book Create or done the same thing in the Harlem Renaissance as this restaurant Red Rooster is doing for a modern day Harlem Renaissance. Can we see the parallels? Incidentally, Marcus Samuelson's restaurant in Harlem is doing just that. It's part of a new Harlem Renaissance that we can absolutely parallel when we are doing our history unit on the Harlem Renaissance. All right, let me find my chat again. Thoughts, comments about this one, ways you could use it, other things that you'd like to ask. If you are a chef and you do work in a restaurant, other things we should be talking about here. My kids find the idea of fusion food really interesting. Like something that is, you know, American and Brazilian. And what does that look like together? or something that is like Southeast Asian with Mexican food and what does that look like together? Again, we're pushing creative, open-ended ideas. Ooh, I like that. Yes. Yes, that's a brilliant idea. How would you persuade others to try this? So if you've ordered this food and you're eating it, oh, what words would you use to describe it? Convince me that I need to order that. That's brilliant. Love that. That'd be really fun. Okay, for sake of time, I'm going to move on. But if you have other connections, keep them coming in the chat. Okay. This one, again, started out of the pandemic where I was trying to think, okay, and one of the positives that came out of the pandemic is that a lot of museums and historical sites put things online. And so we could travel to the Great Barrier Reef with a marine biologist and see things. We could go see the bats fly out of the cave in New Mexico. Like we could go do those things. And that's where I started with my own kids when we were doing like little school during the pandemic, like we were gonna take a trip. Once a week, we were gonna take a trip to learn about different people, different locations, different cultures that we couldn't go and travel to see now, or that may be too far, that maybe we could never get to see. And it could be something like going to see a music festival or zooming in when um, the Holocaust Museum in Washington DC has, has pop-up Zooms where you can zoom in and an actual docent takes you around on a tour. Like you could do some of these things. 
And we're just asking, how does this location make you feel? I asked another way, what impact does it have on you? If you were there, what would it sound like? What might it feel like to be in that space? Would it be really, really crowded? And how would you tell? Would you, would, or would it feel wide open? Then we're asking, like, how can you connect something from this new location with something from our own community, something that we've seen? And again, if you're with your teacher hat that we're, we call this funds of knowledge. That's the technical term for valuing and honoring students' home and community assets. Again, something we should be doing more in schools that we, we don't do enough of. That every kid comes to school from a home and a community that should be valued. And so we're saying, bring that knowledge. We want that knowledge. We're now in, we're now at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC, make a connection to something in your community. And my students from Tucson go, oh, we have an Air and Space Museum there and it's got like hangers and hangers of old military planes and the kids take a field trip there. Yes, how is something you see there connected to that? The next one's an interesting one that I did with my graduate students when we went to the Grand Canyon. I took 22 graduate students to the Grand Canyon to do some place-based education work over the summer. And we said, what do you think this location will look like in the future? What is our obligation to preserve this site? And, the and we looked at it in connection with the national park system who's um, should be, noted for revitalizing a lot of their national parks to actually talk about the indigenous cultures that have lived there before the parks were there. And how can we start to think about that framework as we go places? So this can be done with any age, any grade level. It's fun to do as an adult too. It's fun to go to a location in person or virtually and just stand there for a minute. How does it make you feel? What sounds do you notice in that place? And if you're there virtually, what do you think it sounds like? Sometimes we move so fast through things like, let's just stop for a minute and just listen. How do we think it sounds? How does it make us feel? I was at a tour of the Getty with a, a dear friend of mine and we went on the museum tour and they put you in front of one painting in the beginning of the tour and you, you look at it and they ask you questions about it. And then as you rotate, the tour takes about two hours and then it ends with the same painting. But when you're standing there looking at the painting for the second time, it's different because the sun's location in the sky is different than when the tour started. And the way the light is coming through the window is different. And it, the room feels different. You see different things in the painting. That's what we're trying to get at here for students is that if you went to that location in midday on a weekday with lots of tourists, would it be different than if you went at night when there was no one? How would that change it for you? Again, no right answers to these questions, just getting them to think in those divergent ways. All right, before we go on to the last one, thoughts, comments about this one. It's a lot of fun. And if there's a place that you went to as a kid that you really love, take them to that virtually or in person and ask them these questions. If you're doing a road trip or if you're going away on spring break, try this wherever you end up. It doesn't need to be a fancy museum or anything. It could be like a walk in the park. Try it, see what you get. Any other questions you'd like to add to this set that we have here? Mm. Yes, Todd, yes, exactly. The juxtaposition between prior knowledge and new learning, absolutely. And we could ask the same question. That's a brilliant question, Todd. We could ask the same question. Like, have you ever, as an adult, have you ever read a book as an adult that you read as a kid 
or that you read in different parts of your life. Right, I happen to be a huge Tolkien fan, right? So I, you know, I read The Hobbit once at 11 and then again at 14 and then again at fill in the age box, right? And the book itself doesn't change, but I change and where I am in my life changed and my background changed and my lived experiences and my life experience have changed. Yes, that's a wonderful point. Like, let's go to this place now and then maybe we go back at the end of the school year and what's different about it we're maybe we're the different variable because we've learned new things i, I love that todd I'm, I'm writing that down right now okay final one final one um we play games with our kids all the time and it doesn't matter whether those games are like electronic, like some kind of digital game, or whether they're a card game or a board game, it doesn't matter. But games are a great way for problem solving, and they're just fun, and we like to do them as a family. Like, I, my family has been known to come to blows over a Pictionary game, right? Like, I think I have a little scar, or my sister winged a board at my eye. Maybe not push it that far, but let's think about games. And that we can ask our kids questions while we're playing the game. And have we thought about games in this way? Like, why are the rules of a game constructed? And if we change the rules, how does it alter the game? How does it alter the game? And why might that rule be in place? My graduate students just did an experiential task that I've had my fourth graders do for. 10 years. And what you have them do, and your kids might like this too, is think about a four square game, like, you know, backyard playing on the pavement, four squares. What they have to do is they have to transfer that four square game that's played in base four. Oh, you can't see that in the site. Sorry. Um, that's played in base four. They have to transfer it to a base 10 frame. So think about what they have to do here. And if you were doing this in a classroom with kids, they'd have to do all the math, right? So they have to figure out, I used, I played this in fours. Now what would my 10 frame look like? And what are the rules for that game? And how big are the squares going to be? And how am I measuring this out? And I'm writing down the rules. My graduate students spend almost 45 minutes doing the math and constructing a, a life-size, actual size version of the game on the pavement. They had to write up their rules and we had to play each other's game. And we listed all the math standards that are being met here and everything else that we're talking about. But if we're playing go fish or if we're playing crazy eights or if we're playing old maid, I hate that name, but if we're playing old maid and we change the rules, how would it alter the game? And what would the new rule be? Does this game follow the same pattern of other games? And again, I'd like to take credit for that question. I can't, it came from my, eight-year-old cousin, my, my cousin's child, so my second cousin, he lives in New York, and I was doing this with him over Zoom, and I was talking to him about games, and we're talking about some patterns in games that we see, and he says to me, oh, so does the game of Quidditch in Harry Potter, like I'm Quidditch. I'm like, what is Quidditch? And then I realized it was the game from Harry Potter, right? It's not an actual game. It's a made up game. But JK Rollins created that made up game based on patterns of other games. And he saw that and we talked about it. So he was asking, how does that made up game of Quidditch follow some of the patterns of other games that we know. And we were coming up, let's talk about some of the games that we know that made, that led to this made up game. And how could we create our own version or create our own game? What would we change? What would that be? What would that sound like? And today we're not gonna play Hoyle's version of Crazy Eights. We're gonna play our family's version of Crazy Eights. And what does that look like? And here's our family's rules. It's just another way that when you're having family game night, try it, 
play it out. Can we change one of these rules? And why? Do we like the old rules better? Do the new rules give us more or less flexibility? Again, depending on how far you take this conversation down a rabbit hole, it could lead to some interesting conversations about rules in general, and that maybe rules are not always applied equally to all groups of people in society and that they haven't been. Again, you know your context, but that's where when I'm doing my classroom work, we're talking about looking at content through an anti-bias framework lens, looking at content to openly challenge systems of oppression. That's the critical work. And so a conversation about rules that we talk about in a game, who do rules help? Who do they not help? Does the rules favor some participants in this game and not others? If we're creating our own game, do we? how can we be cognizant of that fact? You can go there. All right, let me pull up my chat. Oh, ah, shoot. Thoughts, comments about this one? Any games that you, oh yeah, my family loves to play this game. Maybe we can alter a rule. Here might be a question I might pose in relation to that game. Just have fun with it. Just have fun with it. Nicole, I'm sorry. I know we're over our time, I'll move, I'll move quickly, I promise. This is where, again, if we're partnering our, our teacher and our parent hat, that we're looking at parents, we are talent scouts. We are the talent scouts for our kids. And we know what they can do. And we see them in different contexts than a teacher might at school. And so when, when we're cultivating and pushing these habits of mind for our kids at home, share that with their teacher if they don't see or haven't seen, right? Like my little one, I'm thankful that he has such a wonderful kindergarten teacher who doesn't see him just as a behavior problem, but sees how interesting and quirky and brilliant his thinking is, but we have to push on that. Mm. I know, I know. And you're right. And to me, we teachers will say, oh, but this is in the standards, but this isn't what I teach. And that's where I come back with the challenge that the standards are the floor. They're not the ceiling. And the standards do not speak to instruction. And in fact, in the Common Core framework, they openly state that they don't speak to instruction. So we can meet those standards in lots of different ways. Just like I was giving you the example with the four square and the, and the 10 frame, that is an actual fourth grade task that I do with my students. And it meets all of the fourth grade standards looking at numbers in base 10, but it's done through that creative exploratory way. So that's where we can push a little bit that it's not asking the teacher to do anything different than what they were going to do, but it's asking for different avenues of, of exploration within it. So if my son was always going to be assigned to read this little chapter book, or my nephew was being assigned to read that little chapter book in the third grade, that's okay. Okay. But can we talk about ethical issues inside of that? his teacher was going to ask the regular who is the main character and what is the conflict and what's the plot sequence okay those are fine but what ethical issues in this text parallel another text that you've read what ethical issues in this text parallel something going on in the news or in your community all it takes is reframing that question but your comment in the chat is well taken like i that's where the teachers that I work with, we, we talk a lot about that, that it's about using the instructional time we have to reframe our questions, to get more open-endedness, to reframe our tasks so that every product we do in the classroom isn't written and isn't a five paragraph essay for students to show what they know and can do. That works for some kids, not others. And then for me, this is like, 
where I, I have had to, in all honesty, like I've had to push myself that, okay, like, how am I, how would I answer that question? Or how am I, you know, not doing the very adult thing and like, oh, what does the placard say when I go to the museum? But like, if I was writing that placard, what would I say this painting is about? I loved somebody in the chat said, you know, how would I convince someone to order that meal? Like I've had to push myself outside of my own comfort zone that I've taken time. I now go on one virtual field trip every two weeks, me, myself, by myself in my office at work. I explore something that I want to see. Maybe I'll take my kids there. Maybe I won't, <laughs> you know, but I, I like things, right? Like, and do I have, have I really given the time to exploring my own interests and passions? Maybe not. So I try to do that. Yeah, I, I know, um, Brandon, I think it's a great point that like, I, right, I think we school the fun right out of kids, right? I think we don't drop the F-bomb enough at school. We don't use the word fun. And if you don't like the word fun because we think it's not as teachery, let's use the word engagement. Like we need to be doing things that are more engaging. We need to be doing things that are more interesting, that are more exciting, that kids go, oh yeah. Like my grad, I told you my graduate students did that base four to base 10 problem. And we have class every day on Friday from nine to four. And so it's Friday night, like 6.30 p.m. And I got two texts from two different students going, I really loved that. Like, I loved playing that game. Like, I rem I'm gonna remember that, you know? And it's like, these are 20 somethings texting their professor on a Friday night, but they had an experience. And they're not gonna remember 10 years from now when they when they have their own classroom and they're doing wonderful work in the districts they're not going to remember things that i taught them or individual lessons but they might remember the day that they made their own four square game they might remember the way that that made them feel they might remember the way that they engaged with their colleagues and thought about the math and that's what i care about yeah i'm sorry i know we're i know we're running over i know we're over time, um, I, let me put let me put my contact information up. Oh no, you oh, shoot! Hang on. And um, those that asked about the slides, because you, if you RSVP to this, and then, then you're on um, the list to be sent the slides uh, in the next couple of days. So not only is the email address in the chat, but also you'll get an email from us at IAA, uh, the same place you. RSVP'd for this to with the um with the slides that Jess will share with us. Yes, perfect. I will send the entire link to Nicole and Laurie, and then they'll blast it out. That is my direct email. If you're trying this and something went really well and you or you came up with another brilliant idea, like I've copied all the ones that we came up with in the chat, and I'm gonna go back and create some new questions based on them. So I'm super excited for like the group think and the expertise that's been in this on this webinar I I'm truly humbled to have all these comments going on uh and the video recording I don't sometimes are faster than others on getting that out we're going to do our best to get it get it onto our YouTube channel uh but for now I don't want to make any promises so for now it'll be slides which seems like has a lot of the information, but um, we should get the video up in the next couple of weeks too. And please feel free to reach out to me. Like I, I love getting emails. I love hearing from things that are that are going on, things that are exciting. If you find a virtual field trip that we all need to be going on or a part of, send it to me. We'll blast it out. That would be fabulous. Oh, you're getting lots of thank yous. And um, if anyone has any last kind of overarching questions, it seems like. You asked a lot throughout, throughout the time, but if anyone does have any last questions, feel free to pop that in there. If you need to run for, for dinner, totally understand. But um, thank you everyone for coming. And thank you for our East Coast friends for hanging in there. It's late back there. It is.
Well, I'll give it just a minute in case that someone's typing a question. Sounds good. I don't want to cut, cut anybody off, but um, yeah, we're so glad so many people could make it. I guess it's prime time for East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we're gearing up for the Super Bowl out here in Phoenix. It'll be a it'll be a trafficy weekend. <laughs> we had it last year, so must be nice. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I agree. That was a really awesome presentation and so many ideas and so much flexibility to adapt it for whatever role you interact with, mm -hmm. with kids um, in. So like I'm I'm not a parent, but I work with the kids in our program all the time. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunities um, and ideas that you shared that will be useful for me as well. So thank you very much. And my pleasure. Thank you ladies for having me and for all your help with this. It, it, it's been an honor to come and work with all of your wonderful um, participants. Oh. Thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, keep an eye on your inboxes for the slides in the, in the coming days. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jess. Bye. Nice to meet you, Laurie. Nice to meet you, Nicole. Nice to meet Likewise. you.